And in, in dealing with the curriculum is where Gibbon goes from being just a school management system to being um, something that does virtual learning environment type stuff as well. So it brings in some overlap with systems like Moodle. Um, as I mentioned in one of the earlier sessions, I'm a huge believer that if you can get your school functionality in mostly into one system, you can start making a lot better use of your data. So for example, if your grades are in um, a school management system, but your um, student work, your student portfolio is in a different system, you can't tie those two together in any meaningful way and understand more about your students. So for me, a huge benefit of having curriculum in Gibbon is that we can see academic information alongside um, the learning and the student behavior and the individual needs and school attendance and visits to the nurse and all of these connected things, right, that, that work together to help or hinder your students. Um, so I'll start by looking at unit and lesson planning in Gibbon. Um, so for this one, I'm going to log in to my school's given installation. Um, so let me just pull this up here so I can keep an eye on the chat. Okay. So I mentioned earlier, sign in with Google. We do, and here you see the calendar integration as well. Um, Okay, so if I go into Learn and then Planner, I'll see I've dropped straight into the Lesson Planner. And in the Lesson Planner, I can't do anything today because school is closed, but I could jump back to one of my ICT classes and see the learning that's been planned through that year. All the various lessons, uh, starting from the oldest in red, these have all been studied, up to the newest right through to the end of term. Um, this gives teachers a really quick and easy way to do lesson by lesson planning. Um, it's as simple as choosing a lesson here, or, um, and we looked at this earlier in terms of the timetable, if there was a plan, a lesson I hadn't planned for, this tick would be a plus sign, I would click on it, and it would take me to that same screen with the time and date already filled in. Um, so as simply as saying, this is the lesson I want to teach, uh, so let's say what is RAM, this is the date I'm going to teach it, and this is the start time and the end time. And again, if you're using the timetable, this bit's auto-completed. Um, and then entering the, the details of my lesson and pressing submit, I can create a single lesson plan that is available to students and optionally parents as well. Um, and this is where a lot of my colleagues at ICHK started, just planning one lesson at a time. Um, and it's a quick way to get information out uh, to the people who need it, um, but it's not a, an especially structured way to do things. So that is just lesson by lesson planning. Um, you can take a lesson that you've created and copy it elsewhere, so you can reuse, but all of your content is stuck uh, per lesson. So um, the next step up from that is to use units, and you can create units and use them to bring together lessons in their simplest form. So for example, Programming 101 is a unit with a description and some keywords um, and a unit planner. And then I can start attaching lessons to that through here. Uh, but where Gibbon offers you something that's a lot more powerful as far as planning goes, is that I can actually plan out all of my content. Oh, so you can do outcomes uh, by unit and lesson as well if you want to do sort of Atlas Rubicon style uh, outcome mapping. Um, where things get much more interesting for planning is if you use smart blocks. So the way smart blocks work is that you take all of the content for your whole unit and instead of dividing it into lessons, you divide it into chunks that are a lesson or smaller. And so in this unit, you can see that I have a block up here that I've estimated is going to take five minutes. And now some teachers get really upset at this. They're like, how can you plan at this, at this level? Surely things are going to change and, and everything's going to go wrong. Uh, but the system actually helps you, and I'll show this. To help, it, it helps you to manage this. What the five minutes is, is simply a guess at the time. Um, so in that block, I've placed certain content. 
And this is just a, a prompt, a bit of writing and a set of images to get my students thinking about the power of programming. Why should we program? From there, we go through a, a short introduction about programming, a bit of information about the assessment, learning about where you can find Scratch, and then getting into some Scratch playtime. So at our school, running at 70 minute periods, this is one lesson down here. And what the system lets me do is to roll out all of this content through this unit into lesson plans really quickly. So once I've created my unit plan, I can say, right, I want to teach this over five lessons, and the content gets divided by time from the top to the bottom into the lessons. And so you can think of it as a content management system for curriculum and start planning in a much more efficient way. Yes? If different teachers are teaching the same unit, can they plan the smart blocks into different lessons? Um, yep. So the, the pushing out into lessons happens on a unit by unit, so on a class by class basis. And you don't even need to run this unit for every class. You could turn it off for some classes. Um, but I can push out that content to one class at a time. And when it's pushed out to that class and the teacher running that class edits it, they're not editing the master blocks, they're editing child blocks. Uh, and so they can customize, if something happens in their lesson and they want to change the plan, they can do that without changing the master plan. But if they want to, they can then push it back to update the master as well. So it tries to give you a system where instead of your lesson plans being these static Word documents that no one ever looks at, your lessons are actually living things that you're working on. Um, so if I was to edit this class's unit, you'll see here is lesson one that's on uh, period three, Wednesday, 7th of December. Here's lesson two, lesson three, and so on. And as a teacher, I can say, well, actually I ran out of time and I never had a chance to run this. So I'm going to drag and drop it into the next lesson. So you can start moving content around in a really flexible manner. Um, for me as a teacher, at the start of this school year, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to guess. How much time do you think it took to take my units from last year, put them into this year, and then create all my lesson plans for the whole year? Any guesses? It's just a button. I just looked at it funny and it did it. Yeah. Uh, the whole process took me about three hours in the end, um, and then that was my planning done for the year. Right? Of course, I had to move lessons around and account for things that change and students who need more time. But again, I can add a lesson in at any time. But the fundamental process of managing my workflow once the units are created is hugely simplified. Um, and for me, as, as a school, there's so much time to be saved by uh, doing essential things like this in a more efficient way. Um, so now when I meet teachers who are crying on Sunday night because they have to do lesson plans for Monday morning, I know there's a solution for that. <laughs> it just takes a little bit of discipline. Um, so that is the given approach to unit and lesson planning. Um, going up a level in terms of considering your whole school curriculum, I mentioned that you can create outcomes and that you can stick those, uh, you can associate those outcomes with units and lessons. Um, when we looked at this unit, and this is new as of version 13, um, there's concepts and keywords. So as teachers are creating units, they can uh, code up some of the keywords. And they can say that this unit should be included in the school-wide curriculum map. And then what the school can do from a leadership level looking down or a department level um, is look at generating a scope and sequence based on all those units. So in a lot of schools, you create your scope and sequence and then you create your lessons and then your units and then your lessons. What Given lets you do is create your units and then automatically create the scope and sequence from that. So I can say... Uh, in here under the ICT department, show me year seven, eight, and nine ICT, and I'm generated, I have automatically generated what is happening in year seven ICT, year eight, and year nine, with all the keywords and the ability to then uh, view those units and drill in 
and see what the content is, look at resources, look at outcomes, look at individual classes and what they've studied. Uh, these concepts and keywords over here on the right hand side, if I want to see, for example, creativity, where else is that being covered in the curriculum? I can click on that and it takes me into the concept explorer, which is up there at the top of that menu with scope and sequence. And I can now see the different places in school where creativity has been tagged as part of the unit. If I approach this directly from the Concept Explorer, I can see a, a, a word cloud of all the keywords in school and what occurs the most often. So I can start getting an overview of, of what is happening in our whole school. Um, I might want to trim that down a bit and say, well, why don't I just look at what's happening in year eight? So these are the words that apply to year eight. Hold on, hang on. No, it doesn't filter back up the top, I don't think. No. I oversold that. I should add that. That'd be nice. Try that one more time. Um, this came about as we went through the Council of International Schools CIS accreditation and they started asking questions that seemed like they would take a lot of time for staff to cook up all this documentation. Um, so we went about it uh, in a more efficient way and said, well, why don't we have it all created automatically? Um, and this uh, helped us get through that process of accreditation. So, <clears throat> with these concepts, are they just tied to the, the series of lessons or, or the individual lesson or are they tied to a grade? Just to units. Just to the units. Unit. And the unit exists in a course which is attached to a year group. Okay. Right, so you could tie a concept back to a, a year group in school if you wanted to. Um, so that, that all exists in the planner module. Um, there's a few other features in there, but those are the main things. Um, so you're planning at the lesson and unit level, the outcomes, and then the whole school overview in terms of scope and sequence of what's going on. Um, and hopefully schools are interested in that. They're interested in saying, well, what are we doing in year seven and how does that impact what's happening in year nine and are things being repeated and are we, you know, do we have a, a sensible, solid progression for our students? Um, okay, I'd like to move on to assessment. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I do that? Okay, so this is sort of the next bit about curriculum and curriculum related matters. Um, for this, I'm just going to go back into my local installation. Let me get rid of that string replacement we set up earlier. So if you look at assess um, in a in a vanilla installation with no extra modules, you'll find five uh, different modules for you. Um, the primary ones that we use for, um, for student assessment are the formal assessment and the mark book assessment. Um, and the way to think about what we use each of them for is that in formal assessment you have external assessments and internal assessments. So your external assessments are your public exams and your standardized tests. Um, these are um, run by the whole school and they are marked by an external authority and you are recording student results. Internal assessments are run at the whole school level or the year group level but they're centralized but they are marked internally. Um, so they may be end of year mock exams um, or uh, a certain mass test that everyone in school has to sit or everyone in the year has to sit. Um, so those are two levels, external formal assessments and internal formal assessments. And then in the mark book module, you have um, informal teacher-driven assessments. So it's uh, the teacher who is creating the column, or sometimes the head of department, but it's not at the school level, and it's the teacher who's entering the data. So we try and think of assessment in, at those three levels. Um, the mark book is where most schools start because it's a constant problem for teachers to track the grades that they're creating and the comments and to give feedback. Um, so the basic principle is that 
a marked book belongs to a particular class and can have any number of columns which you can define under add. In each column you can decide um, to store four different bits of information. You might store, um, you might assess on attainment, in which case you might have a, a scale, a grade scale, so you might choose percentage or uh, your UK national curriculum, and you can also choose to use a rubric if rubrics are enabled, so not on the system, I don't think. Um, then you can also assess for effort, so not how well has the student done, but how hard have they tried. Um, and again, with a scale and a rubric. Uh, and then you can write a comment and upload a file as a form of response to the student. So you turn those features on and off and customize them as you like. And then you see the column here with the results that are going to appear. So uh, there's no data here at the moment. So let's say I was a teacher, I would click here and I would say, well, this student got a six for attainment and a seven for um, effort. And I'll say, very well done. I could choose a file here and then submit a column. So we now start to see the student data appear here. Um, with the different grading scales, they have a like a threshold level above below which the student has not succeeded, um, and the system can track how many um, marks a student has got below a, below that threshold, and it can create alerts automatically, uh, helping you flag up students who are having academic. Um, if you don't like that one-size-fits-all view of education that you need to get above 60 to be a successful human, um, you can set individual targets. So I could say, well, Julian, uh, his target is five, but for this student, their target is three. When you then, you then see the target here, and instead of this being done against the threshold, it's now assessed against their personal target. Um, so at my school we use a combination of the external assessments, internal assessments and mark book to manage um, student assessment data. Uh, in terms of the other options up there, you, you can create rubrics, you can do long-term graphing and uh, Excel-based tracking. Crowd assessment is like peer assessment but on a bigger scale. Um, and then a, a, both our primary and secondary campuses, we have a custom-built Rapid36 uh, reporting module that we use for end-of-year reports, uh, teachers to input grades and marks, and then export them to PDF so the parents can print them out. And there's a new version of the open source one out for the next couple of days. Fantastic. Excellent. So as well as Andy's custom uh, modules, he also has the open source one that you just mentioned, which is very kindly made available to free, for free. Um, and as you said, there's a new version coming out. Um, the last work that was done on this was by Sandra um, in terms of the mark book. Um, and she added features like rearrangeable columns um, and uh, raw scores and various uh, calculations around scores. Is there anything you want to say about that? The, the settings for it are all in the markbook settings in School of Men, and it's primarily for schools that use percentage-based uh, assessment. So it can do some cumulative averages, um, calculations, weightings, all the wonderful things that lead to very numeric assessment. Yes. Um, so Sandra found, I think, adopting given that my approach and my school's approach to assessment was quite different to hers, and so there's been some work there. We tend to do less numeric. We might give numbers out, but we don't uh, do averages and things like that. Yeah, if I was a kid, I'd prefer to give it <laughs> I wasn't trying to make a sales pitch there either. Um, one of the things that you'll find in quite a lot of the settings screens in Gibbon is comma-separated lists like this. So when I create a markbook column, I need to select a type for the column. Um, and the problem with a lot of systems is they come with a preset list of types, but the list of types that every school wants is completely different. Um, so if the, 
the default types don't suit you, you can just come and remove and add types as you wish. No need to program anything, you just do it in that setting and then turn it on. And what you'll find with the markbook is there's a whole range of settings in terms of how it works that allow you to customize without having to code anything. Um, okay, I've mentioned reporting um, already in terms of um, Andy's module. Um, I know Andy's worked on reporting for longer than some of us have been alive, I think. Uh, is there anything you want to say about reporting other than that every school does it completely differently? Exactly that, yes. Yeah. Everyone does it completely differently. Even schools in the same organisation. Yeah. Which gives me plenty of work. There you go. So there's your custom reporting solution. But the new open source version is more flexible. Than so it might suit more schools. Sounds good. Um, okay, uh, one of the things that Gibbon provides with its ability to plug in modules is to just reimagine the way schools do things. So um, I've been working on something over the last few years at my school called Free Learning, which I'll give as a demo here, uh, partly because I just like to talk about this because I find it so much fun. Uh, Ray's probably sick of this already. Um, but also as a means to demonstrate the flexibility inherent in a system where you can build plugins that do different things. Um, so uh, at my own school, if you go to learn, you see this extra option called free learning. And the premise behind free learning is not to teach groups of students in the way that I'm teaching you here, uh, not to stand and talk and make everyone learn the same thing at the same time. The aim is to give students a, a wide range of options of what to learn. Uh, I like that look on your face. There we go. How does that possibly work? Um, and so the way I'll demonstrate this to you is I will uh, narrow down from the 119 options that are currently available at our school. I'll just pull out the ICT ones, which is where we've done most of the work because we originated this. Um, and so my ICT students have 79 options um, for ICT study. In school. They can't do any of them in any order though, there's a structure here. And you see the structure clearly if you go to map view. So in map view we see here in blue a unit that students can start with. This is their gateway unit. So they would click on that unit and start studying through the content of that unit which is rich HTML. And at the end of the unit it asks them to produce some kind of evidence of what they've learned by studying through this. And they might do this individually, they might do it in pairs or a group. Um, but at the start of the unit, they will enroll. So, and then, oops, some of that. Um, and then at the end of the unit, they'll submit the evidence to me, and I will say whether the evidence is approved or not approved, whether they finished the unit or not yet, and I'll give them um, some comment-based feedback. And as, sorry? Um, and it's, that, the first few units are quite heavy on reading, but it gets much more practical after that. So quite a lot of them are to do with tearing apart computers and electronics um, and playing with different things. Um, some of them involve students leaving the classroom to do things independently, like the photography. Um, there's a, a unit in here on sleep in which the students get to find a quiet place in school and have a nap, right? Uh, but the nap is, uh, is part of a larger project where they, they assess their own sleep and they look at how technology affects their sleep, whether they're using devices right before trying to go to sleep which can stop you falling asleep, um, and they use uh, some different apps to help them get better at sleeping, which is the ICT connection, right? Um, and of course the students love it. We can learn how to sleep and we get to sleep in school. Um, so the aim is to make learning much more interesting for students and to give them the power to choose their own path through learning. Um, what we find is that students have engaged uh, really well and they're starting to become more independent in ICT so that they're no longer relying on me to tell them what to do and when to do it and who to do it with. Uh, they're starting to become more independent. Uh, so for me, this is 
this really is the power of Gibbon, that you can have all this normal school stuff going on in your school, you can take attendance, you can do grading, um, you can do your lessons, but at, in some part of the school you can do something that's completely different, that's experimental, that's new, and, and have the flexibility to do that.